Hey, welcome to the show. I have a very special guest with me today, Mr. Clive Thompson from Switzerland. Uh, I think you're English, though, correct? I'm English by origin, yeah. And living I've lived in, in Switzerland? Switzerland most of my life. Uh, so before we kind of get into our discussion around money and CBDCs and sort of some things around the financial markets, Clive, please do me a favor and introduce yourself and let tell us a little bit about your story and kind of why you this, these topics interest you. Uh, well, my name is Clive Thompson, uh, and I've been in private banking for 47 years. I'm retired now, so I don't do anything for money anymore. I'm not paid. Uh, so I'm doing this because I want to get the word out as to what's going on in the world of finance. Okay. Uh, it's great fun to keep on top of the way things are going. And I think we're at a very interesting and unusual time at the moment because I see great changes in the coming decade, if not much sooner, with our monetary system. Um, I think the main comment I've got is that the financial system that we are we know, the post Bretton Woods financial system from 1971 onwards, uh, is drawing to its close, and it will be heralding in something new fairly soon. What got you sort of interested or aware that this change was coming? What were the markers for you? Ever since I've been started ever since I started work in 1975 uh, in the UK at the time we had fairly high inflation uh, I'm, I'm talking double digits most of the time and it was a bit of a dream of Margaret Thatcher at the time to get inflation down to five percent one day um, little did she dream that it would go much lower than that but uh, it, I remember at one point I was uh, asking my boss for a pay rise because I didn't think my 20% pay rise was enough because inflation was running hotter than that. Wow. Um, anyway, so I, I, I'd always been interested in uh, uh, the the fact that prices of everything was going up, and it took me some years to work out why. Um, uh, obviously, I've known this for many decades now, but the reason prices are rising is the amount of money on the planet is increasing. And as you increase the amount of money on the planet, the money is worth less. The goods aren't actually worth any more. A house is still worth a house. A painting is still worth a painting. A bar of gold is still worth a bar of gold. A bar of chocolate is a bar of chocolate and so on. But the money doesn't buy as much of these things. And uh, we've uh, after up until 1971, the inflation was fairly slow globally. Um, if we look at uh, what happened in 1971, the USA had been printing money uh, way beyond its ability to redeem it in gold because it was redeemable as far as foreign nations were concerned up until 1971. And uh, the French uh, sent in one of their battleships to New York Harbor and said, can we have our gold back? We've, here's your money. We'd like our gold. And uh, at that, that point, uh, President Nixon uh pastor an edict basically saying the gold window is temporarily closed to stop these wicked foreign nations from demanding their gold back from us uh so that was the last last time any foreign nation could change their uh, money which was officially the dollars was officially gold up until then into gold at the official exchange rate so once America was now freed from the shackles of being tied to gold after 1971, uh, the spe speed and pace of printing accelerated, but not just in America. It was all around the world. Every country which had any kind of currency, as they saw America inflating, printing money, they said, well, we well, can do that too. And printing money gradually became the solution for every problem known to uh, the financial markets. Okay. Uh, so, for example, when we saw long-term capital management, LTCM, collapse in the late 90s, they were bailed out by the Federal Reserve, uh, and so were the banks. And over and over again, uh, we had uh, financial crises which required intervention from the Federal Reserve, from the European Central Bank, from the Bank of England and other central banks to calm the markets. And the usual way of doing this is to uh, print some money, uh, which is uh, basically the government borrows the money from the Federal Reserve or from the Bank of England, who then prints it in return, and the government spends the money to bail out whatever's got the latest problem. So here we are uh, once again with uh, in 2023 with more bailouts coming uh, for the various banks which are struggling. Uh, we saw 
today was it or yes yesterday actually i think no today was uh credit suisse uh re received a bailout from the swiss government and we all that, saw what happened last week with silicon if, valley bank if these banks around the world have been printing their own money via loans and having kind of bailouts whenever they have a problem why do they not have enough money now like what's what created the current so, uh, situation so so the, the the problem which we saw last week was with the silicon valley bank which had got a lot of cash and had invested that cash a long time ago into long-term government bonds yielding yeah. one and three quarters percent at the time and that was fine because they were paying their depositors let's say a quarter percent or something like that way below what they were earning but then the Federal Reserve, starting from about May, but accelerating from September, started raising rates rapidly last year. We saw rates rise to well over 4.5%. And that meant that the depositors were starting to look for better rates. So they're moving their money out of Silicon Valley Bank, looking for better rates. And Silicon Valley Bank, which had the safest investments on the planet at the time, because they'd bought a lot of treasury bonds. Uh, I'm going to say they discovered, of course, they knew this all along, that those treasury bonds had been falling in price as interest rates rose. So uh, most bond markets are down 20 odd percent over the last year or so. So their bonds would have been down, I'm going to say 20%, I don't know the exact figure. And uh, as people withdrew their money, they would have to sell the bonds and that crystallized the losses. And then that uh, drew the attention of the short sellers who could see that they were realizing losses, which were going to wipe out their capital. And there was a, basically a run on the bank. Um, so what's now happened in the USA, uh, the US government has said to all the banks, uh, it's not the government, it's the Federal Reserve, we will lend you 100% against your bonds, even if they're only worth 80%. Uh, you just give us your bonds and we'll give you 100 back. So all the banks which are in trouble with their long-dated bonds will now be put whole. At least they'll be able to repay their depositors uh, until those bonds have to be repurchased or, or taken back as a loan in one year's time. Right. Um, but the, the people are starting to wake up and realise it's not just the banks which had invested in government bonds, which might be in trouble. If you think about it, a lot of bank assets are long-term assets. For example, mortgages and real estate loans. So okay. I myself uh, took out my mortgage some years ago when interest rates in Switzerland were minus 0.75%. Now, obviously, my bank didn't give me a negative rate on my mortgage, but I'm actually paying around 1% interest on the mortgage. But Swiss interest rates are higher than that now. So I think if I went to my bank and said, would you like me to buy my mortgage back from you? And I'll give you 90%. If they had their brains in gear, they'd bite my arm off for it because that would be a bargain for them. But they're not going to do it because if they were to sell me my mortgage back at a discount of 10%, uh, they'd have to crystallize that loss. And uh, clearly the banks don't uh, want or need any more losses appearing in their balance sheets at this time. But the reality is, all banks have got a lot of long-term loans, and those long-term loans, no matter which way you look at it, are not worth the face value. They're worth a lot less. Okay. So what does this mean for like the global financial system? Is the whole debt charade about to collapse like a house of cards? Um, I, I think there's a lot of fear at the moment. But okay. I'm quite optimistic that the central banks will do their job and guarantee every type of situation which crops up. So they've done their best at the moment to uh, pour water on the fire with the action already taken by promising an unlimited bailout for all the American banks who want to deposit their bonds with the Federal Reserve. Um, if this starts to spread to other countries, as I think it might, I'm sure the other central banks will take the same action. So I don't really... Uh, I'm optimistic that it won't turn into a, a complete rout, but there's okay. certainly a lot of nervousness out there. Now that brings us to the problem that you mentioned a few minutes ago, that if you keep increasing the money supply, the price of assets continues to fall. So if there's another round of bailouts, will we see more inflation globally? Yeah, so uh, as I see it, the, American, uh, the Federal Reserve has just said to all the banks, give us 
your bonds, which perhaps are worth 80, 80 cents on the dollar, and okay. we'll give you 100 face value in return. Uh, so that is expanding the central bank's balance sheet. And of course, it's chucking money, it's effectively chucking money into the system. So uh, that inflation is still there, and it's going to go on. Now, we, we have a, um, a debt ceiling in America, uh, which has been reached some weeks ago, and they're fighting over it. Uh, it doesn't mean to say America has stopped spending money. Um, as we all know from Janet Yellen's letter, they are helping themselves to the uh, federal employees and civil servants pension fund and taking their assets to keep paying the bills. And they promised to put that pension fund whole uh, when they raise the debt ceiling. So the reality is the plan is to carry on uh, from the government's point of view, it's spending more than they collect in taxes, and they have to borrow that from the Federal Reserve, which means the Federal Reserve has to print it. How do you think this ties into new currencies like a CBDC? So it, it's kind of unconnected, but it's going to happen. The digital currency is on its way. All major central banks are working on a central bank digital currency. And I haven't got up to speed with all the central banks, but I've had a good look at the various papers produced by the Treasury, the Bank of England and the UK government on this. Okay. Um, it seems to me that many countries will have the central bank digital currency up and running by about 2025, um, certainly in test phase, if not actually working. Um, now, the UK has said they expect to bring in the central bank digital currency at some point between 2025 and the end of the decade. But no final decision has been made whether to do it or not. But uh, given the amount of uh, study they're putting into it, the fact they're employing or hiring people to do it, it seems almost certain that it's on its way and it's going to happen. So let's just talk so, about the UK for a second. So let's say the UK introduces a digital pound, a CBDC, where the money goes directly from the Bank of England to the citizens. What does that mean for the commercial banks? Well, uh, on day one, um, the there's two. There'll be two, effectively two currencies in, in existence, which are, to all intents, uh, intents and purposes, the same thing, like dollars and cents. Okay. Uh, you'll be you'll be able to move your bank dollars into CBDCs, and you'll be able to move your CBDCs back again at will. Uh, if you have it in your CBDC wallet, whether it's in your own wallet, on your phone, or kept by your bank it will be effectively central bank, uh, your kind of body risk is central, the central bank. And presumably you won't, your bank won't be lending your CBDCs to anybody. But the rest of your money, which is your bank account, uh, which is the old British pound, uh, they'll carry on doing what they've always done with it, lending it to all and sundry. And probably okay. people you wouldn't lend it to yourself. The British government has said, and it's in writing in the various papers, that there will be a limit on how much you can hold in your CBDC wallet, at least initially. Um, and the figure they're talking about is between 10 and 20,000 um, pounds. What does that mean practically? It means that, uh, well, what, the reason they want to have a limit is they don't want the CBDC disrupting either the banks or the economy. Uh, but what does it mean in practice? It means that if you get more than £20,000 in your wallet because someone's paid you or you're a company and you're receiving lots of incoming funds, uh, they will sweep it out. That's what they say. Um, now, my assumption is they sweep it out to your bank and don't sweep it out uh, for the government's benefit. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they're going to limit it. Um, so you will have a limit initially on how many CBDCs you could hold. Do you think this would apply to business accounts? Uh, they said it will, but they haven't decided what the limit will be. I mean, what if you're uh, a, a said, very large company that like yeah, they get a they basically said they're going to sweep the wallet if you have more than whatever their limit is. So yes, it, it's going to apply. So you they wouldn't be able to run payroll out of a CBDC account then. Um, well, that, obviously they're going to have some arrangements whereby if your money goes in and your money goes out, your balance will stay below the limit. Um, okay, and t timing issue, I guess. But, uh, you know, they definitely uh, uh, they, they have definitely said that limits will apply to corporations as well. Uh, but they're in a consultation phase about what those limits should be and how they will apply to different types of businesses. Now, in the United States, we have a very corrupt system where powerful sectors of the 
<laughs> business community have a lot of influence on the government. Is that the case in the UK? So like, are there powerful industries that could get that change if that's going to be very disruptive for them to be able to thrive? Um, it's very hard for me to say, but what I can say is a lot of politicians declare a lot of income way above what they actually earn from their okay. salaries. Got so it. they do get a lot of, I mean, I think the way it's done is through speaking engagements, book book commissions and all sorts of other things. Okay. So there is influence, but it's uh, it's not bribery. I guess it just surprised me that such a blatantly anti-business practice could get implemented that affect would affect all the businesses, right? If if you're not able to f use the banking system to, well, I guess you can still use the bank, right? You just can't use well, your You can, yeah, you could, you'll be able, they'll be able to use the banks in exactly the same way as they're using them at the moment. Don't you think eventually though, the, the legacy pound will go away and it will be just the CBDC or no? So uh, over the, the first plan is to get everybody accustomed to using the CBDC. Okay. In other words, they would like you to pay. They would like you to pay your taxes in the new CBDC. They'd like the shop prices to be the new CBDC. Your rent to be in that, and of course your salary. Yeah. It will take time for that to work its way through the system, but I think it's likely that shop prices will fairly soon, to all intents and purposes, be only the CBDC, and the use of notes and coins will be dying away. People will find it. I think it's sad to say, but people will find it very convenient. Uh, to go shopping with their cards because they're already very used to shopping with their cards. It just won't be quite the same card. Well, it, well, I suppose it could be because they can still have their bank cards, but they will also have their CBDC card on their phone or in or whatever shape it takes. Now, the businesses that take payments, so like every store, they're going to need a pretty quick set up to take these new CBDC payments, right? Do you think that's already being worked on? Like how to have point of sale systems for CBDCs? Or they're not doing that yet? Well, it's going to be phased in gradually. So it wouldn't be terribly different from a, a business accepting credit card payments and uh, digital payments from its bank. It'd just be a, an extension of the existing Got system. It. So it'd be like adding but, Apple Pay or Google Pay on to a point yeah, of sale it, system. It would be CBDC. Okay. So, so the plan is the plan is to bring in the CBDC to start with, get everybody used to it. Now, the thing about getting everybody used to it is it does bring in uh, an element of maybe control or uh, surveillance. Uh, now, there's a lot in the papers in the UK saying they're not going to be monitoring what their citizens do with the money uh, that neither the Bank of England nor the government. Uh, but obviously somebody is going to be doing that for the purposes of anti-money laundering, just as you have your credit card monitored. Got it. Uh, and the way they're talking at the moment is they're going to outsource that monitoring of what you spend your money on to the to your to the financial institutions, possibly your bank or possibly some other financial institutions. Okay. So it will be it will be monitored. Um, they're also at the moment saying the. Uh, CBDC in the UK will not be programmable, um, but that's obviously initially. Um, we have to know what programmable means. It means if they do have a programmable currency or it's capable of being programmed, it means that they could change the interest rate you're earning, give you a negative interest rate, charge you a tax on every transaction. Uh, they could make your money expire at a certain date. They could even tell you where you're allowed to spend your social security or your uh, uh you know, the money you're receiving if you haven't got a job your unemployment pay uh they might say you can spend it on food but you're not allowed to spend it in the movie theater uh there's a lot of things that they could do if it becomes programmable now they're saying they won't uh, but in some countries it definitely will be programmable do you think that it will initially be delivered to citizens via like a universal basic income type of like free money approach in response to a crisis I think the public would welcome that at large because everybody likes a bit of free money. Right. And let's face it, the, there's a lot of dissent at the moment amongst the public at large who can't afford to pay their electricity bills and food prices are going through the roof. I think it's about 16% inflation in, in food. So I think the people would quite uh, welcome any sort of universal basic income. And I'll get to how that might come about in a minute, but uh, it's certainly a possibility. Okay. 
The other thing that I, I personally find a little suspicious is this idea that it's going to take years for this to be implemented. It sounds to me like if I were doing it, what I would do is I would say I'm working on it. And then if something catastrophic happened and I just so happen to have this software ready, I might say, hey, you know what? We've been working on this thing. We, we just so happen to have it ready. Maybe we should just do this now because people need yeah, some kind well, of stimulus. Well, well, exactly. I mean, they, they very much before uh, doing something ca uh, with the currency, I'll we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. They'd like to get everybody familiar with it and working with it rather than bring it in a, in a huge rush, uh, okay. which would be chaotic and okay. cause lots of unrest. But let's assume that things go according to plan and many countries by, let's say, 2025, have a working version of the CBDC, which has acquired a lot of adoption by 2026 and is almost universally used by 2027. If we have at some point a crisis, and I'm assuming it'll be in 2027 or beyond, but of course it could be tomorrow, but if we have a crisis of some sort and people are speculating against the currency or the bond market is collapsing or people are hoarding goods they go down to the shops and buying up everything they can and the shops shelves are empty it might well be an opportunity to say we're in a crisis and we're going to do something about it and what we're going to do about it is we're going to stop people converting their old currency which is in your bank into their cbdc wallets in other words what you had up until now you've been converting freely subject to that twenty thousand pound limit in the uk or whatever it happens to be okay. into your cbdc wallet but now the limit for conversions is $500 or zero or, su or suspended temporarily. So if that happens, we now have an economy running only on the CBDC and the speculators have got all these old, this old money in their banks. They can't speculate against, well, they can speculate against the old currency, but they can't speculate against the CBDC, which means effectively, uh, because one's not convertible to the other anymore, we have two prices. We have a, the value of the old currency, which would be trading at a very large discount. And we have the CBDC, which will still be nominally one-to-one, -one, except you can't change your money one-to-one -one with the old currency. So we might get into a situation where they flip the switch. And I think I heard you use the word, Molly, at some point, rip off the Band-Aid. Um, so they have a, once the CBDC is running, they have a quick, sharp rip off the Band-Aid and try to reset the system. Um, now, when the first country does that, everybody in every other country is going to panic because they're going to say, we'll be next. So each country around the world will be forced to take the same action almost simultaneously because otherwise people immediately start speculating against the other currencies as well. Um, and I just want to talk about what would follow okay. if they do this. The, the rationale for preventing conversion from the, uh, from the old pounds in your bank to the new currency, which I'm going to call the CBDC, but in the old days we'd have called it the new dollar or the new peso or the new dollar, uh, pound or whatever it is, but we're going to call it the CBDC for simplicity. The rationale is massively, or much too much government debt. And we're already in a situation where the level of government debt is completely unsustainable. It's a struggle to pay the interest on the national debt. They certainly can't pay it out of taxes. They're paying it out of newly borrowed money. So it's a uh, basically it's a it's a sort of Ponzi scheme. It's a spiral. And once it starts to spiral out of control, they have to switch switch it off. So basically, once we have the economy running on the new currency, they can switch off conversion from the old currency. It won't be one-to-one -one anymore. And now they have a debt-to-GDP ratio in the new currency of zero. So from the government's perspective, they'll be able to spend a lot of money on a universal basic income. That's where the universal basic income might come, because this will take uh, create some disruptions of, for pensioners and others. Uh, they'll be able to bail out the pension funds. They'll be able to do an awful lot of things. They'll be able to go on infrastructure uh, spending projects that add, no matter how much money they spend, it'll be virtually impossible to get to the kind of debt to GDP ratio that we're at at the moment. Uh, in other words, they'll have a lot of governments will have a lot of leeway in spending terms. Um, for the average Joe, if he's got a mortgage, that mortgage is going to be left behind most likely in the old currency too. 
so he'll be as happy as a lark because he'll have he on day before it happens he'll have a house and a mortgage and after it happens he'll have a house and a mortgage in a defunct currency one which you can buy for almost nothing so he'll be happy because his house will be worth a lot more or, well, well the house will be worth more but the house won't be so encumbered by his debt and he'll be able to start spending again likewise if he's got any legacy credit card bills when they flip the switch those old dollars if they're in if they're if, if it's his bank credit card as opposed to a cbdc one uh, they'll be left behind in the old currency and he'll have that much more spending money in his pocket and last but not least the government won't need to take money out of your pay packet to service a national debt which has spiraled out of control uh, and as far as corporations are concerned they will be freed of debt because the debt will be left behind in the old currency so their bonds will be denominated in dollars or pounds not in cbdc so those dollars and pounds will be withering away in terms of the, their value to zero so we'll basically it'll be kind of like a giant debt forgiveness across the planet and you can imagine how bullish that'll be for the world uh, when suddenly all corporations are freed of debt uh, all governments are freed of debt and all individuals are freed of debt uh, but that comes with consequences, because the other side of the coin is there will be the bag holders, those who held the debt. And those who, now it's not the banks, because the banks will be evenly balanced. They'll have uh, liabilities and assets in the old currency. They'll still be balanced. So that's not so much the problem. The problem will be the pension funds who hold bonds, the foreign governments who hold treasuries, uh, the wealthy individuals who've got money market funds or who've got bank deposits. Uh, so the bag holders will, to a large extent, be the wealthy who are holding those bonds because someone is going to be holding bonds, somebody's going to be holding the money market funds, somebody's going to be holding the cash. And broadly speaking, they will be the losers. Now, a lot of those holders won't suffer all that much because they probably have other assets but there will be some hardship cases uh if, for example there'll be some pensioners for example many pensioners who literally had their life savings at the bank and they suddenly find themselves unable to convert it to the new currency and spend it and whilst they were living a very very nice life uh, way beyond most people's pension funds now suddenly uh they can't do that and they're back to the universal basic income or whatever the bailout money is for the from the government um, now, I'd like to think and I kind of expect there will be some sort of bailout for those who are deserving and who um, unjustly suffered due to this currency reset. Um, but uh, there's no guarantees here. Um, but certainly if you happen to be wealthy, if you happen to be foreign, if you happen to be an international organization holding dollars or pounds or euros, uh, you're probably not going to be first in line for compensation. Wow. You seem to th you seem pretty confident that the two systems will run in parallel for a little while. So we would have a heads up that many of these yes. changes are happening. Okay, I I, I think so. I mean, the the only uh, question which is in my mind: Will people trust the CBDC as much as they trust the dollar and the pound and the euro today? I think they will, but it's not a given. And if there's a sudden level of dis distrust of the currency, the, the governments might be forced to uh, try and find some sort of tangible backing. Whether that will be a tangible backing for the man in the street, i.e. convertible to gold and silver, or whether it will be only between governments remains to be seen. Um, but I, I certainly see it as a possibility. We might get some sort of currency backing if there's a crisis. Although, if I'm a citizen and the government gives me free money and they say you can spend this free money at the grocery store, and it works, what would the distrust be in terms of um, well, I, think that, uh, that, of I think that's the plan. That's the plan to give you some free money so you, you, okay. you do trust it. And um, if I'm an employee and my employer pays me in it and I don't really have a choice how I get mm. paid, I might not have a lot of options there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it, it probably will work. Um, uh, Obviously, uh, we can't tell for sure because it depends how the government starts to behave vis-a-vis -vis the new currency. It also depends on the circumstances surrounding the demise of the old one. 
because if we go back, remember, I said this is only likely to happen if there is some sort of crisis with the old currency. Mm-hmm. Now, if there's a crisis with the old currency, we don't know how people are going to feel when they say, you know, everything's in the new currency now. Um, are they going to say, well, the new one is just the same as the old one? They can print their way out of existence. Or will they say, oh, it's good for another 100 years? I mean, that's, that was going to be my next question is, do you think it's just going to be another fiat with on the blockchain? <laughs> Well, it will be another fiat, I think, um, unless there's a huge level of distrust, uh, in which case they'll be forced to back it. But my feeling is, uh, well, it's not the plan to back it with anything. They don't want to back it with anything. They want to back it with thin air, just as it's backed with thin air at the moment. But, you know, that's uh, unless they can get the levels of debt down, they can't. uh, if, If we carry on as we are, there will be a crisis with the currency. Um, so once they've moved over to the new currency, of course, uh, they'll have a bit of a bit of leeway because it'll take many, many years before their debt level gets up again. Now, do you think the BRICS nations, specifically Russia and China, tying their currencies to gold could force like a game theory onto the West European and US to back their currencies? If we have any major currency block, which is backed by a tangible asset like gold, I think a lot of people will gravitate towards it if they find that guarantee plausible. So if uh, I, if I as an individual was to believe that I could change a particular currency into gold anytime I wanted, and I trust that guarantee, I would far rather hold the guaranteed kind of currency than I would the one which has got no guarantee. And from time to time, I would do my exchange and back into my domestic currency according to my needs. But for long-term savings, uh, people would much prefer a currency which will hold its value. Because that could be a threat, obviously, to the dollar, but also the euro and the pound if the sort of somewhat wealthier people stop storing their value in that currency and start storing it into the Russian ruble or Chinese yuan if it's as you said, believed to be legitimately tied to an asset like gold? Uh, uh, if people trust the this BRICS currency and if they trust that they can convert it into something tangible, yes, I think it will gain traction. Um, but I'm not sure people are lining up at the moment to buy Russian rubles. <laughs> right. They, I don't even know, know, like as an American, do, I don't even know how you would do that. Yeah. Like, and I, how do I, yeah, let's I, say I, it is redeemable in gold. Do I have to go to Russia and get the gold? Like, can I... Well, exactly. So you would, unless you actually believe you could walk into your bank and convert it to something tangible, you Got wouldn't it. do it. Okay. But we don't know what shape it's going to take. I mean, one of the things which is happening is a lot of the central banks are buying up gold uh, on the sly uh, to have a place at the table if we get into a world crisis and have to restart the monetary system, because certainly gold might well play a part in a new system. It's not guaranteed, but it's... Uh, always has done historically uh so if we move into a situation of a new Bretton woods type agreement um those sorts of nations the BRICS, didn't get a seat at the table last time but they want a seat at the table next time and if you have the gold you'll get a seat and you'll have a say in how things pan out um so uh, you know it's not a certainty that we will um have a a one-off currency reset. We might just have a lot of inflation and then suddenly have to back the currency by something tangible. Um, we'll see which way it pans out. But I'm I'm thinking the most likely scenario is a currency reset after the CBDC has been running for, for a year or two. Interesting. So you think if we did have a currency reset and due to pressure, the central banks did have to back their currencies with gold, do you think they would revalue gold so that it makes them look a lot richer than they are today? Um, there's certainly not enough gold in any central bank to cover even a fraction of the currency out there. Um, I did some maths some months ago on the US Federal Reserve, and um, I I was going by the probably very wrong assumption that the gold actually does belong to the Federal Reserve. But if they wanted to back a certain percentage of their currency, I think I came up with 20 or 30% of the currency with gold, it would have to be at eight and a half thousand dollars a lot higher than it is today. Um, Of course, the question would be, how much of your currency do you need to actually have backed and how much of it doesn't need to be backed? 
Um, you know, the problem which occurred uh, when we came off the gold standard was there just was too much of the currency not backed by gold. So when people started redeeming it, the coffers were going empty and they had to shut the door. But if gold became dramatically more expensive, like $100,000 an ounce, you could issue a whole lot more currency <laughs> and have it backed. Uh, that would be a brilliant trick uh, by the governments because it would solve a lot of problems uh, as long as you could maintain that price. I don't think it would do. they would do that because obviously that would suck a lot of gold out of the ground and that would be inflationary in itself. Okay. You can imagine what the gold, the gold miners are going to do at that sort of price. Uh, but uh, suddenly if the gold price was higher, it would suck out more gold, but not enough to destroy it. Now, what do you think about the thesis that we're, the globe is moving to an asset-backed currency world and it includes gold among others, others being silver, oil, potentially food commodities, basically anything that's considered high value that nations would could barter with each other could become backing for a new currency? Um, I think there's a real possibility that the central banks will call a Bretton Woods type conference, Bretton Woods being in 1944, when they agreed that uh, the US dollar was backed by gold and that all other nations would back their currencies with the US dollar. So wherever you were in the world, you could change, or well, the governments at least could change their uh, currency to dollars and the dollars was then convertible into gold. Um, we could have another conference like that. Um, the situation with government borrowing has become quite dire and confidence in currencies is becoming more fragile and uh, that can disrupt the financial system. Agreed. Now let's talk a little bit about the blockchain for a minute in that there's sort of this thesis as well that all of the capital markets and all the money will move to the blockchain because it's faster and cheaper to move money around. Do you sort of see a world where everything is tokenized, including stock and bond markets as well as currencies? Um, I think it's inevitable that virtually everything will get tokenized in some way, shape or form. And I'm talking okay. about uh, uh, bonds, equities, property. Uh, I, I don't mean the property be transferable uh, as, as a token. What I mean is the token will exist to prove the ownership of the property, to prove the property rights. Um, the idea that you keep it in a central database uh, with some land registry uh, was uh, was quite a modern idea when they did it. Started doing it about fifty or sixty years ago, um, replacing the old deed style. But it's a very antiquated idea now, and I think the way to do it is is some kind of blockchain, which is inspectable by all and sundry to see who owns what, and uh, to provide, which can also provide the evidence as to ownership. Uh, if we go back in history, uh, maybe not so much, it wouldn't happen in America or the UK, uh, but uh, in many places, in some places in Europe, like East Germany um, and uh, in many African countries, there have been situations where people have lost their properties and the records as to their ownership have been completely destroyed. And now these people are decades later are trying to claim back their land or their property and providing evidence or proof as to what happened and what the ownership tra uh, trail was just isn't there. Um, and we saw that uh, when West Germany reunited with East Germany, many people living in Western Germany who owned Eastern European properties wanted their properties back. And it was you know, a very tough process to establish who was the rightful ownership of a property which hadn't been in somebody's hands for 40 years, especially when the records didn't exist. I agree. I think the blockchain and real estate are a match made in heaven in some regards for that. Um, but, you know, blockchain is going to take take over many, many things we do in life. Um, uh, I think one, one thing which uh, is an obvious use for the blockchain is in, in ticketing. Uh, you know, okay. this old concept that we have paper tickets or um, digital tickets, I, I think that's going to be replaced by um, uh, tickets on our phone with ever-changing QR codes for security reasons. A, a changing QR code means that nobody can take a photocopy of it and try and pass themselves off as the real ticket holder because mm. the QR code at any moment has to correspond with the reader at the other end. And as it's constantly changing, you can't uh, do what people have done sometimes at pop concerts in the past, which is uh, 
click a photo of their friends one and two people get into the pop concert mm. um so uh ticketing i think is a big thing i think um nfts for the ownership of uh items to prove okay. their provenance will be a big thing um uh, digital works of art um you can imagine that uh, there will be that, that there are people who want to own the original even though there's uh, the signed original even though there are copies out there um you know i'd much rather hang a mona lisa on my wall than a a, a fake mona lisa and if okay. i was going to own an, an a digital copy of the uh, mona lisa i'd much rather have um a, a, an nft signed and endorsed by la louvre museum in paris than i would one which has been uh downloaded from an internet site because the signed one carries more more weight for me one thing that we messaged about that I'd love to talk about now, because sort of you alluded that it's a little bit timely or relevant to what's going on in this banking crisis, is the stock market crash from 1987. What what can we learn from that? Tell us a little bit about like how you think it started and why does that matter now? Um, well, I was uh, just downloading. Um, I'll just show you a lot downloading. I Back in, back in 1987, as the stock market plunged, oh, wow. I, I, uh, uh, in the days before and the, and the weeks afterwards, I downloaded, or rather not downloaded, I bought the newspapers to see what was going on in the world. And I thought, one day this might be useful to read it. You've saved and those since 1987? I have indeed. And, and just huh. before we spoke, I thought, I'll go and have a look through and see awesome. what I can find. Okay. Uh, um, but I, if if I could just show you, can I just show you uh, on the screen uh, a, a picture, a couple of pictures, which gives you a, a feel for the way things were going. Uh, let's just take. Uh, sure. uh, I'm, I'm going to take a few. I'll I'll talk about what happened and, uh, as well. Um, let me just make. Let's give me a second view. And make that zoom to fit. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so uh, I'll just flip through a few pictures here uh, just to give you a feel of what was hit. Here we have the, the, the stock exchanges um, plunging in the days uh, through there. Uh, let's just have a look here. So, I'm just gonna, the, so let's, in the day, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about, let me just put that so you can see it better. Zoom to fit. Um, in the days prior to the stock market crash of 1987, we were having in Britain, the largest ever IPO in all of history. I'll just come, come back to the screen here. Uh, that was the British Petroleum uh, okay. IPO. Uh, it was 7.5 billion pounds, about $12 million billion at the time. So investors around the world, but mainly in Britain were starting to stockpile cash in readiness to subscribe to this amazingly attractively underpriced massively underpriced issue okay but then we had a whole bunch of storms in a certain sense all at the same time uh for example the dollar uh or the u.s government or the u.s that's right the usa had a a uh, huge trade deficit announced, massive trade deficit. It was, it was the worst ever in all of history. Uh, and as you probably know from uh, economics, the trade deficit is usually bad for the currency. So the dollar was falling and interest rates were rising. They were above 10%. So we interest rates were rising, dollar falling, uh, trade deficit. Uh, it wasn't looking too good. And investors in stocks were becoming nervous and started to sell them off a little bit. So we came into Friday, which would have been uh, October the 17th, I think, or might be the 16th. Uh, let me just have a quick look here. Uh, da, 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 I can find that. I'm just going to look at the uh, newspaper for the day. Uh, this, yeah. So a uh, quick, quick look at a French newspaper here, but uh, I, I know it won't mean much to me. But it says uh, uh, 
tornado on the stock exchange. Just that's just an illustration of that. Uh, that was uh, okay. published on the twentieth, March Tuesday, the twentieth. So it would have been the sixteenth. So on Friday, the sixteenth, U.S. stocks had a pretty horrendous fall. It was, I think, it was down five hundred points on the Dow, which was an all-time record, um, and that was after London had closed. Uh, so uh, pretty awful. But at the weekend, we had uh, actually it was on Friday in London. We had England's worst ever before and since tornado. There's never been a tornado in the UK. Like an it actual weather tornado? The of the UK. Not a Yeah, it was a weather war. tornado. Okay. Yeah. Uh, railways were out of, completely out of service. All the motorways were out of service. Bankers and stockbrokers couldn't go to work on Friday. I mean, seriously, couldn't go to work. The stock exchange was shut down. Nothing was uh, Nothing was working. You couldn't get into the city of London. Not possible. And the whole of England was... Uh, incapable of moving because everything was out of action. All the power lines were down. Um, so come Monday morning in London, the sell orders from all around the world, especially Asia, had been piling up on the stockbrokers' desks. Uh, they were coming in by fax. We didn't uh, we didn't have any email or internet back then. So the stockbrokers' fax machines had been buzzing all weekend with sell, 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 sell from Asia mainly and other places, but because London was a major financial center for trading stocks at the time. So come Monday morning, there was still nobody or virtually nobody at their desk. They couldn't get into town. The trains still weren't running. The motorways were still mostly out of action. And even if you could have got on a motorway, it would have been completely gridlocked. So nobody went to work, uh, just couldn't get to work. in. Uh, and so the stock exchange was uh, empty. There was nobody there. And yet all these sell orders were there with no jobbers to make a market or take the positions. So London went into free fall, New York followed, and the rest of the world fell. And we had what turned out to be, they called it Black Monday. It was the worst ever fall in all of stock market history. And that continued for several days afterwards. Um, and uh, everybody thought it was the end of the world. Um, but actually... Um, the world kind of uh, came out of it and the stock market ended up higher that year than it had started. Wow. And do you think something similar could happen now? Obviously not the tornado necessarily, but in terms of like uh, a dramatic... You know, uh, things can come out of nowhere unexpectedly. Um, it, you know, we might have seen uh, a failure of Credit Suisse today had the Swiss government not stepped in and lent them a lot of money. I think they're 50 or 60 billion they were lent. Uh, but who knows what tomorrow holds or next week holds? Who knows that there won't be a a, a, ge a, a, a geological event? You know, I, I can imagine some disasters which might occur almost anywhere in the world from volcanoes to earthquakes to uh, weather, weather freak weather. Um, it, it might be a a political crisis. Um, I, perhaps I forgot to mention something which was going on prior to the stock market crash of 87. Um, Iran was at war with Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Okay. And there was a lot of nervousness about the Middle East and the war in Middle East, which was ongoing between Iran and Iraq. Uh, at the time of the stock market crash, and I think it might have been uh, as it was happening, America decided to step in and sank some Iranian uh, rigs, oil rigs, uh, which obviously the Iranians saw that as an act of aggression and subsequently declared war on America. Well, I think probably the Americans shrugged their shoulders and said, go on, then what are you going to do about it? Uh, or words to that effect. But uh, it was obviously an extremely uh, nervous situation um, going on in the Middle East. And so that that nervousness contributed to everything which was going on. And maybe just an afterthought on, on the, we I, I mentioned the British petroleum rights issue, which was mm -hmm. planned before the stock market crash. Okay. As soon as the stock market crash happened, all the underwriters went along and besieged the government to let them off their obligations because they were going to be left holding the bag. 
because they had oh. underwritten this issue, even though this issue was massively underwritten at a price of 120 when the shares were worth, I don't know, 170, 180, something like that. Uh, it, so selling them to the public at large was basically a free money giveaway by the British government, or at least it seemed like that up until the crash. It was a did free money go, giveaway to all the British. Did it still go public as scheduled? Well, um, before this all happened, uh, the British public had been very well trained to take up as much as they can get of every government sell-off because they're all done at an undervalue. But of course, as the crash happened, the share price dipped massively below the 120 pence that the it went down to about 60 or 70 pence. The government was selling them at 100, or the IPO was at 170 pence. So anybody who would have taken up the, sh the shares would have been an absolute fool. Having said that, about 23,000 British investors trusted the government so much that they nevertheless subscribed to the shares at 120 pence when they could have bought them in the market for 70 pence. Um, but there were a lot of takers. But most of the issue, almost all of the issue, was left in the hands of the underwriters. And they were in deep trouble because uh, they were losing hundreds of millions of pounds for having, under, obviously, they would have earned big fees, but the fees were nothing compared with their losses. And they were losing hundreds of millions of pounds, and they were besieging the government for to help them out, and da 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 And then, miraculously, somebody, not very much to the British government's liking, came to the rescue. And that was the Kuwait Investment Office, who swooped in and bought up all the surplus shares that the British government hadn't been, they didn't buy it from the government, they bought them from the underwriters, all the surplus shares that the government hadn't been able to sell to the public. And then, of course, we had uh, a huge chunk of British petroleum owned by the Kuwaitis. And you can imagine the consternation that created in Parliament, having a, a foreign nation owning one of, or at least a, a substantial part of one of Britain's prime assets. Did that tie into the conflicts in Kuwait years later? Uh, not no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it was it, it, that we're talking. Uh, well, it was 19, 1987. Uh, so what's that? Fifty years ago, something like that. Long time ago, no, it didn't. But uh, yeah, because we went. So that was, was uh, back in ninety one. There, when we did the first Gulf War, that was in Kuwait was involved in that. Yeah, uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, didn't it? Hmm. Was it was it ninety one? I thought it was later than that, but no, it was much later than that. I can't remember when that. There was, was a conflict in ninety one. Okay, okay. In the first, what we called the first Gulf War, or whatever. Um, interesting. All right, so let's go back to wrap up the CBDC discussion. So there's a lot of fear and concern around CBDCs. Do you generally think that it's something people should worry about, or is it just an inevitability and just sort of figure out how to? navigate your own personal journey through it? I think those who feel strongly about it, and I have to say there's not a large number of people, uh, should be talking to their, their ministers, their okay. government ministers, and telling them that they don't want these things to be pro programmable. They don't right. want them to have too much surveillance. Uh, they don't want them to have, have the ability to switch them off after three months or, or all the certain, all of those sort of things. Uh, but to say that you can stop it, it's going to be a struggle. Um, okay. The central banks are determined to do it. So we should advocate for say what I would what I've referred to as a CBDC Bill of Rights. Yes, I think so. Um, there is a petition on the UK government's website, uh, okay. which uh, basically says if you get a hundred thousand signatures together, we'll discuss this in Parliament. Uh, I discuss not discuss whether we'll have a CBDC, but we'll discuss whether it'll be. Or, or programmable or not. Um, so it's only got about 29,000 signatures so far. So anyone who is a British citizen or a British resident may go and take part in that uh, petition on the British government's website. You just have to Google uh, petition about CBDC and you'll find it. Then you can sign the petition and become one of the uh, 29,000 people and try and get up to 100,000. Now, do you think the digital euro, the ECB will issue a CBDC as well? Um, it's all coming. All every every major nation is working on it. I think there's now more than 100 countries which are working on digital currencies, and some of them have already introduced those digital currencies, like Nigeria, for example. Mm -hmm. 
Now, well, countries in Europe, because not every country in Europe does the euro. So do you think we'll see some change in memberships around that as this change comes along? Well, obviously, uh, Britain pulled out of the euro, but there's no no strong noise that anyone else will pull out. But obviously, if the Italians don't get their way and don't get the money off the central bank, they might have no choice. And do you think we'll see a digital dollar before or after, or it doesn't matter? I'm I'm reckoning it'll occur 2027, 2026, maybe. Okay. And that, that actually feels like a lifetime away, to be honest. I mean, it's four years from now. It's interesting that they're talking about it so often. I mean, I feel like the Fed brings this up fairly regularly. Is it just to condition us so when it comes, we're just used to it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a bit like Brexit. You know, they started talking about it four or five years before they had the vote. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, I think the same, uh, well, they had the vote that four or five years before they implemented it. Um, and I think the same applies to the digital currency. They're getting us used to the idea that it's coming. Uh, the debates are up there. Every government has got a website discussing it. Uh, all the governments now employing people to be uh, experts in different areas of the digital currency. Um, it's uh, definitely coming. Interesting. All right. Well, we have a we are. It's an exciting time to be alive, and that we seem to have quite a few changes to the world of money, certainly in other aspects as well. Yeah. And I, I see you have on your shelf the creature from Jekyll Island. Yes, I was very influenced by that book regarding the role of the Federal Reserve in our uh, monetary system. Yeah, I, I have ordered it. It should arrive in the next few days. So I'm looking forward to reading it. it. I hear it's quite a tome. It is. I actually listened to it on audiobook initially, too. Um, it's it's not a feel-good book. <laughs> it, oh. <laughs> just to be aware. And it does sort of shed some light on pretty much every presidential assassination and things like the Lusitania, the Titanic, World War One, why the West got involved. Uh, everything seems to tie back to the banks in some capacity. Interesting. Oh, I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah, cool. Clive, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time, especially I know it's in the evening over in Switzerland. Uh, and I hope we can continue to stay in touch as we watch this world of blockchain and money and CBDCs evolve. Good. And my, my final word to everybody is make sure you diversify your assets. Don't have all your eggs in one basket. Uh, there's no single outcome, even though I have suggested there's a possible outcome of a reset, but other things might play out. We might have very high inflation, be intangible assets, don't hold too much uh, fiat assets like bonds, cash, or money markets. Good advice. Thank you.